Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's event with CircuitStream and the University of California, Irvine. Uh, before I officially kick the event off today and jump into the, the presentation, uh, first off, I always just like to make sure that uh, everybody in the audience can see me OK, everybody can hear me OK. Um, there should be some emojis uh, that you can interact with, or you can type in the chat there. Perfect. I see some thumbs up there. Sure can. Awesome. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Angel, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. So uh, with that, the uh, the chat log is in the bottom right corner. Uh, feel free to interact with that throughout the entire presentation today. Uh, beside the chat log, there is a questions tab. Um, at the end of this full presentation, we're going to go through some Q&A. So try and utilize the questions tab, but don't be upset if we don't answer them as we go through the presentation. Uh, the goal is we're going to take a little bit of time at the end and kind of go through that. Uh, if you want to react in, in real time and kind of interact, you can still put questions into the chat tab as well. Uh, and then there's also a polls tab. Uh, I'm going to have three polls that I'll drop into the presentation today. Uh, there should be one, I believe, already in the polls tab. And there'll be two more that will pop in uh, probably about halfway through or a little bit later. So um, that's it for the, uh, the, the, the program itself and, and kind of how the platform here works. Um, uh, actually, you know what? I'll invite uh, everybody to share where they're joining us from as well. Um, so I'm joining from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. That's actually where we were uh, founded. CircuitStream was founded. Uh, I can see Upland, California. Uh, oh, another Calgary. Awesome. Awesome. California. I'm assuming we're probably going to see lots of Californias here today. California, 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 Irvine, Southern California, Pasadena, California, Virginia. Nice. Um, I don't know, California, San Diego. Awesome. Awesome. Um, California is one of my favorite states. Uh, anytime I get the opportunity to go down there for a conference or convention, I go down immediately. Um, I think I, I might be heading back for uh, the GDC conference taking place in March. Um, I think it's in uh, San Francisco. So, uh, but welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, I will get the, the presentation started. Um, I can start off here by introducing myself. So Let's make this screen a little bit bigger because you don't need to see my face as big here. Uh, so my name is Tyler. I am the marketing events manager at CircuitStream. I've been with the company for just over two years. I previously worked in travel and tourism for about 10 plus years, uh, kind of in, in pre-COVID times. And I am a video game enthusiast myself. We will have uh, two guest speakers joining us from the gaming industry today. Uh, Drew Erridge is the CEO and engineering leader at Game Breaking Studios. Uh, he will be the first and he'll be hopping on stage in just a few minutes to share information on how to break into the gaming industry. We will also have uh, Elizabeth Pring, a QA engineer at Riot Games, uh, joining us after Drew to share information on the world of game testing for a large game studio. So I'll invite those uh, folks up on stage and not too long here. I'm going to kick off the presentation by speaking a little bit about the partnership between CircuitStream uh, and the University of California, Irvine. Uh, collaboration between education companies and research, in, in, research institutions fosters innovation and provides students with access to high quality education and resources. Uh, curriculums that are aligned with current industry trends and demands ensures that students receive education that is important for their future and for their careers. Universities are hubs of academic and professional networks, providing students with the opportunity to connect with peers, professors, and professionals from various fields. Uh, this partnership now adds the University of California, Irvine to the top list of global universities partnered with CircuitStream to deliver XR development and design and also game development education. So uh, to speak a little bit more about that and the, uh, the value of the partnership overall, I wanted to invite uh, Brian Breen up on stage. Uh, Brian is the Chief Corporate Engagement and Partnerships Officer at UCI's Division of Continuing Education. Uh, so welcome, Brian. Thank you, Tyler. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, launch event. We're really excited to have you on uh, this webinar. And uh, hopefully we can provide some valuable information for you to decide if you're interested in, in any of these three programs. Uh, again, as Tyler said, my name is Brian Breen. I'm the Chief Corporate Engagement and Partnerships Officer here at University of California Irvine's Division of Continuing Ed. We, we refer ourselves to as DCE. You'll see that acronym a lot, DCE, Division of Continuing Ed. And uh, DCE is the continuing arm of UC Irvine, focusing on providing working professionals, um, professional development and uh, practical skills and knowledge to help enhance your career. And that's really the bottom line. We have over 60 certificate programs, almost all of them online um, from you know leadership to very highly technical programs. We actually do have an existing esports program, but it's focused a little bit more on management. 
But what we always look for in partners like CircuitStream is to uh, look for really high level quality um, with industry experts and um, some type of content that we really haven't uh, offered on our own. So that's one of the reasons why we're partnering with CircuitStream. We're really thrilled for this, this partnership um, and this pilot uh, program that will be launched uh, coming really soon. And Tyler will share that information with you a little bit later um, during this uh, hour and a half. Um, one of the really great parts about this partnership and collaboration is that it's it's really mutually beneficial for three parties. It's first and foremost you as the learner, second for Circuit Stream, and third for us at UCI. It's a true collaboration where we, um, UCI DCE, takes a look at all of the curriculum and content and reviews it, approves it, and also with all the instructors and the facilitators. It's really important that this is a true partnership and um, that anytime we put our brand and our reputation um, with affiliated with a program like this, we want to make sure that we um, have given an official stamp of approval, which we have wholeheartedly. Um, so that's really important to note. Um, the one of the last things I want to share with you is um, you'll hear from Drew and Elizabeth a little bit later, but one of the biggest benefits of enrolling and registering in a program like this is uh, the industry experts that you'll be affiliated with throughout the, the whole process. Um, and that's really important for you to build your network. If you're looking for just upskilling within um, your current job, if you're looking for a career transition, uh, those relationships and partnerships that you make within the class, not only with your fellow learners, also with your instructor, but also with this industry network uh, is really important. So um, just some advice, take advantage of that opportunity. It's, it's a really important um, part of the program. And lastly, um, You'll have a great support system throughout the whole um, program with Circus Stream representatives. And I uh, just want to let you know if you do enroll, um, UCI is here to support you as well. So uh, please feel free to reach out at any time if um, you have feedback, good and bad, regarding the program. We always want to know so we can improve. But with that, I want to welcome you again. And uh, good luck to all of you who are uh, going to enroll. And uh, we're excited for the partnership. And thanks, Tyler. Amazing. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, thank you for taking the time here to uh, to connect with everybody today. Um, that was amazing. And so if you have any uh, questions for Brian, um, you can um, look in the chat there. Um, oh, I'm just going to share the, uh, the presentation here. Um, sorry, guys, let me get my presentation back up on the screen. There we go. Perfect. So with that being said, uh, I am going to uh, share a little bit of information here, uh, just an overview of CircuitStream, and then I'll share a little bit about the industries as well. So um, the uh, an overview for CircuitStream, I'll start there. So CircuitStream began in 2015 through a network of developers, designers, and creators who were pioneering the virtual and augmented reality ecosystem. CircuitStream saw a need for education and training that would empower people to build Unity and XR applications and advance the industry's frontiers. Uh, we now partner with leading industries, uh, sorry, leading companies and leading educational institutions like UCI to offer uh, courses and training to those looking to learn more about emerging technologies uh, such as game development and also XR development and XR design. Uh, one thing I will note here to everybody is this microphone tends to pick up quite a bit of sound. And uh, of course, they are doing construction just outside of my apartment building today. And I think somebody was just vacuuming in the hallway outside here too. So uh, if you guys hear any background noise, if you're having any trouble hearing me or if, or if it's getting too loud at any point, please just let me know. I can turn the gain up on my microphone. I can try and adjust. Um, but it's always just good to be transparent when you can hear a vacuum going by in the background. Didn't hear a thing. Amazing. I love to hear that, Maggie. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to actually provide uh, an overview of the specific courses a little bit later. I'm going to uh, break down the details for each of the courses, but um, you know, I always like to share information just at the beginning as well, especially when we have uh, an event attendee offer in place. So um, for anybody who is attending uh, this event here today, if, if you're registered and if you're in this session, uh, you would qualify for 15% off of all of the courses that are now available through this partnership with UCI. Um, so 
if you're looking to register or anything, just make sure you let us know uh, that you attended the event and that you're looking to uh, utilize the attendee offer. And we can, uh, of course, make sure. So and again, I'll, I'll go into more details about each of the courses. Uh, something else uh, I should mention too is this full presentation is going to be recorded. So anybody who uh, wants any information afterwards, if you want to take sound, down some information off of the slides, you're certainly welcome to, but you will get a, re a recording of it afterwards. So you're welcome to just kind of sit back and put down your, your pads and note, you know, your, your pens and paper and just kind of take in the information information versus feeling like you have to take detailed notes throughout. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the XR and the gaming industries here and the opportunities are available in both of these spaces. Um, some of you may already know about XR, uh, while well, others may have heard the recent buzz around uh, the new Apple headset and the MetaQuest 3 headset. Uh, both of those were released earlier this year. Uh, either way, I wanted to give everyone a, a brief overview of the industry. So XR stands for extended reality, which encompasses virtual reality, augmented reality, and also mixed reality. The XR industry has grown immensely in the last few years and has made its way into a wide range of industries such as gaming, uh, film, music, manufacturing, healthcare, retail, and many, many more. Uh, many companies are using XR for training simulations, for interactive customer experiences, uh, for project visu visualization, learning experiences, product development, virtual tours, so on and so forth. So uh, it's just kind of exploding into, into all different industries and the, the tech is incredibly useful for training. Uh, the primary roles in XR are usually grouped into either development or design. I'd like to share some of these differences between the two roles for everybody. So XR designers are primarily responsible for conceptualizing ideas and experiences, uh, planning visuals through storyboarding and prototyping to ensure user uh, optimal user experience. On the other hand, XR developers uh, take the design blueprints and they implement them to build an XR app or experience uh, by utilizing the code to bring it to life for the end users. So uh, the design side is a little bit different. The development side is usually a little bit more uh, coding heavy and the design side is a little bit more uh, prototyping heavy. Uh, so de developers and designers generally work closely together. Um, often people will, will go through and learn one skill set and then end up working with another individual or on a team uh, that includes both developers and designers. Uh, we have lots of students that end up collaborating together to do just that. Um, or we do have some people who are interested in learning both um, so that they're able to kind of develop and design an, an XR experience from start to finish on their own. Uh, one thing I always say to people is if you are planning to learn all sides of it, just pace yourself. Uh, make sure you don't try and sign up for both courses simultaneously. Uh, might be a little bit much to do that. Um, but yeah, otherwise, if you're looking to learn both, just as long as you kind of pace the courses, you can certainly do that as well. And uh, UCI uh, DCE, as Brian said before, Division of Continuing Education now offers courses in both of these areas through the partnership with CircuitStream. Uh, the XR industry in California is a hotbed for technology and innovation with numerous companies and research institutions dedicated to advancing XR technologies. The state is home to a vibrant startup ecosystem as well with a focus on developing XR hardware, software and content across different verticals. Major technology companies like Meta, Google, Unity, Apple and Microsoft all have significant XR initiatives and offices in California. Uh, these companies have been developing XR hardware and software and basically shaping the industry's direction for quite a while. And again, any, anytime I come across a slide that's stat heavy, I just always like to, to make sure people know in case you just popped in the room, uh, this will be recorded, the full presentation, so you'll get to see all these stats at the end here. I'll make sure I, I share this with everybody. Um, in, uh, onto the gaming industry. Uh, the gaming industry in California is dynamic and influ influential sector with a rich history of innovation, uh, development and cultural impact. Its tech savvy population contributes to a vibrant gaming culture with esports competitions and gaming conventions drawing enthusiasts from all over the world. Uh, myself in included, like I said, I, I've actually gone to California quite a few times uh, for both um, augmented reality and uh, gaming conventions. There's, there's certainly a lot in that state. Uh, it's home to some of the world's largest and most influential gaming companies as well, including Riot Games, EA, Activation Blizzard, and Sony Interactive Entertainment. It's also home to thriving indie game development scene with many small studios and individual developers creating uh, innovative and unique gaming experiences. And there's certainly opportunities uh, across the board for, for both of those, for the larger studios as well as the, the thriving indie game development scene. Uh, there are currently over 380 game studios located in California alone, which is insane, and uh, over 700 jobs currently supported. Uh, becoming a game developer or designer can be a rewarding career choice for individuals who are passionate about gaming, for those who have a flair for creative and interactive experiences, problem solving, and technology. 
on screen, you can see some of the top reasons why people would choose to work as game developers or as game designers. Now, I would like to uh, welcome our first guest speaker, uh, CEO and engineering leader at Game Breaking Studios, Drew Erridge, on stage. Uh, Drew comes from Riot Games, where he was the tech lead of player behavior team working on the distributed systems behind matchmaking game, matchmaking, sorry, game flow and uh, disruptive behavior detection for 100 million users in League of Legends. I tried to say that sentence like three times before this presentation, and I messed up the words every time. So I'm surprised that came out as smoothly as it did. Uh, he's going to share information with us today on how to break into the gaming industry. So uh, without further ado, uh, Drew, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Tyler. And welcome to Pallet Town. Uh, this is circa Pokemon Silver and Gold, I think. So uh, I'm told it's Pallet Town from Silver and Gold, not from Red and Blue. But um, thanks for the opportunity to speak to a bunch of folks looking to get into the game industry. I always love the opportunity to do that. Um, <clears throat> I can uh, get into my background a little bit here. I do have a presentation. Um, let's see. All right, can everyone see the big welcome? Some thumbs up. Cool. So again, my name is Drew. Um, I got my start in earnest in the game industry when I um, came out to California for uh, college. I went to the University of Southern California and got a CS games degree um, to become a programmer in the games industry. <clears throat> uh, from there, I got a full-time job working at Riot Games, really just across town. Um, and I worked there for about six years. And like Tyler said, I was working on their player behavior team and I was their tech lead when I left. So um, that involved programming features that support our broad goal, which was uh, basically how do you make the 12 year olds be nice to each other on the internet? Um, and if you've played Valorant or League of Legends recently, um, you know that we did not solve that problem in its entirety. <laughs> um, but I like to think we've made a lot of really significant progress. Um, it's a really interesting space. It's really fascinating to work on um, things that are designed not just by game designers, but also by um, psychologists. And we did research in partnership with universities like MIT and Harvard to see like what are the best ways to approach some of these problems. Because really, there's there's three categories of like behavioral uh, or of like tackling tackling this behavioral problem, which is sort of like the obvious one is you know, um, how do you ban the haters, right? Uh, if people are being disruptive in the game, uh, how do you use machine learning to detect hate speech and griefing and any kind of disruptive behavior and either, you know, ban those people or, or hopefully um, help them learn what not to do and how to be a good citizen in your ecosystem. And on the opposite side, you've got this, like, how do you reward positive behavior? Um, so giving, you know, free virtual goods, skins or whatever to folks that are, that are, um, behaving well and, and, um, in your game, in your ecosystem. Um, and those ones are kind of obvious, but then there's this nice, interesting, meaty middle space where, um, what do you, how do you use great game design, psychology, and other principles to remove unnecessary stressors in a game or an experience? So, I mean, League of Legends was where I spent most of my time and I touched the, the new games a little bit before I left, but they're inherently competitive games. Um, and so there's some amount of stress that's always going to be there. You know, if you're playing soccer or basketball or football, the same thing is true, but there's all these other extraneous things. So um, poor matchmaking quality can be a, a thing that contributes to stress in the game. So we rebuilt the matchmaking system. Um, playing with your friends can alleviate a lot of the problems and conflict in a game. So we made systems that, you know, facilitated people playing with their friends. Really interesting space, you know. I spent over half my career there, um, and it was really fascinating. But, but uh, the stars kind of aligned a little over four years ago with some friends of mine that I went to school with over at USC. Like I said, um, also a good school, a, a little bit dicier part of town uh, in downtown LA than in Irvine. A couple of my friends got mugged while they were in school. I don't think that would happen in Irvine. I moved down here a couple of years ago, and it seems like a little bit safer of a of a place. But. Uh... <laughs> So a couple of my friends, the stars were sort of aligning. They wanted to leave their current companies. They were also working in various forms of AAA games and, and tech. And we started Game Breaking Studios, um, which is uh, a co-development studio primarily. And if you don't know what that, it, that means, um, you're not alone. Most people that are not in the game industry don't understand that phrase. Um, but 
there's various words that people use to mean roughly the same thing. There's co-development and contracting and consulting and work for hire. And all of these things have sort of various connotations with them that are slightly different. But ultimately, they mean we help other companies make their games. Um, so Riot is one of our biggest customers. Um, Blizzard is another big customer. And what we do really is Riot will come to us and say, hey, we want to add this new feature to Valorant. Um, we want to release it by the time the next season comes out. We don't have enough people to get it done. Can you send us a team of five people or whatever to come and um, build that feature and help us ship it on time? And so we do a lot of work like that. Um, obviously, for those two big studios and, and a bunch of smaller studios everywhere from prototyping all the way to live production games with millions of users. Oh, we also sell tools um, to the game industry to help other studios um, to build and deploy their games to multiple platforms. Uh, and generally speaking, we just have this large focus on um, engineering for world-class online games. Uh, and that's really kind of where our expertise comes from and, and what we like to do. So we hire people who love to, to build online games. So that's plenty about me and my studio and my background. Um, uh, but let's talk a little bit about uh, the journey that I had getting into games and, and most importantly, how it's applicable to you and sort of the lessons that I learned. Um, and there's one really key lesson that I took away from, from my time through it. I think it's relevant to everyone. Um, folks going through this course material, I think it'll be really relevant to you. And it's basically this. Um, in my journey into games, step one uh, was to build lots of games. Um, and I know, you know, time, time can be limited and we all have lots of things going on, but, um, build lots of games. Doesn't matter how small they are. Um, doesn't matter how big they are. Doesn't matter how good they are. Um, build lots of games and go through that loop. You got to get your reps in of just trying to do this thing, whether that's using coursework or game jams or, um, whatever other means that you can, you know, just getting some friends together to, to put something together over a couple of weeks build lots of games and uh, be very aware as you go through this program or you know do things on your own that uh, it's your first time and pretty much everything you can build is bad so maybe I would restate this as build lots of bad games um, and don't worry too much about it I have a, a large catalog of bad games that I've built if you would like to see them um, I'd be happy to share them and I think that's another really important part is build lots of bad games and release them anyways, because um, getting them in front of other people is how you learn. Like you're going to learn through the development process, but you're going to learn so much more going through the process of actually putting those games out there into the world, even if it's just handing it to your friends at first. Um, but I'd really recommend going even further and, and, you know, put it on a portfolio website, put it out on um, Steam or HIO or the App Store. Um, someone would like to see those games. I have a treat for you. Here's the first game that I finished end to end. Um, this is called Mage Defense. I think it was for a visual basic class in, that I took in high school. I'm pretty sure you can download this on my website, actually. Uh, I don't know if it still runs. <laughs> so uh, the concept of this game is quite simple. Those stormtroopers are going to kill your medieval castle. I don't know why they're in the same universe, but they are. And your job as the Final Fantasy mage here is to shoot them with the very square red fireballs over there. Um, and this is the first game that I went through the full loop and like create an executable that I could, um, you know, I think I put it up on my website, but people could download it. I handed it to my parents and I handed it to a couple of my friends and they like double click and open it on their computer, right? And they could play the game, except they had no idea how to play the game. Um, that was lesson number one was, oh, whoops, I forgot a tutorial. Uh, not everyone knows, you know, okay, it was wazzy to move, left click to shoot the fireball, right click to shoot the thunderbolt or whatever. <clears throat> So that was my first piece of learning by handing my game to someone else is that there's this whole other part of the game, which is just like teaching other people how to use it at all. Um, and there's a whole art to that as well, as I'm sure you've experienced um, as probably game consumers. Um, so a year or two pass, I, I try making some more games and I, I've picked the next one that I'm like, okay, I want to I want to you know get this game out there. I'm excited about this one. Um, it was inspired by uh, uh, Helicopter, which is like actually like an Atari 2600 game or something. Where basically you like press a button and the helicopter goes up. And if you let go, it goes down. And then you're navigating this like landscape with this helicopter trying not to crash. Um, 
I was super excited about this game because I was uh, procedurally generating the levels by the music that you were listening to. Um, this was like 2011 or something. So it was dubstep, uh, <laughs> dubstep music that you were listening to. Uh, really excited about this game. I put in the tutorial text so people would know how to play. There were only like three buttons or whatever. Um, and I was like, I'm going to release this on the Android app store because I figured out like, okay, I had found a tutorial on how to export my game onto Android. And uh, I spent like a hundred hours um, just, just, you know, tuning this game. I wanted it to feel perfect. The controls to feel perfect. The difficulty to feel perfect. Really proud of this game. Um, and then I think over Christmas break that year, I released it on the App Store. Um, and it turns out people did not agree with me. I'll give you a minute to read some of the, uh, the Internet's feelings about my game. I particularly appreciate the, the guy in the bottom right who um, took the time to write a comment and defend me and say, don't pick on him because his game is bad. Um, don't blame the game, not the creator, but still gave me a one star review. <laughs> um, but after I got over the initial shock uh, of everyone not feeling the way I did about this game, um, I tried to parse through this feedback for some uh, extra you know, knowledge. What could I take out of this? What was actually the theme here? And it turned out there was a lot of themes around controls and difficulty, um, which is where I'd spent all this time, so it didn't make sense to me. What was going on? I had been playing this game for like 100 hours, and I was tuning it so that it felt just right to me. Um, that was actually the problem. It was tuned to me as a 100-hour player instead of uh, to the person who just picked it up and was a five-minute player. And I had not accounted for the fact that, you know, these brand new players are going to have such a different experience of the game than I had after uh, 100 hours in the game. And that's why they felt the controls were touchy, because it was really easy for me to, you know, be really adept at clicking the button at the right time. So I needed to make this smoother ramp into the game. And so, you know, um, this game actually, despite all these horrible reviews and things like that, this game was actually really meaningful um, to me. And I took that feedback, listen to it, and try to do it again and do it better. But even with all that, um, putting it out there on the App Store, this game uh, was kind of the key thing that got me my first internship at Microsoft um, and kind of got me, you know, my my do foot in the door for programming. I wasn't working on games at the time, but, you know, you get started wherever you can and, and find your way in, right? And Microsoft was a great place to get started with that. But I showed this game uh, when I went for my interviews like a month later. Uh, I kind of showed it off to some of the interviewers, and I think that was really the thing that got my foot in the door. So, yeah, build lots of games, build lots of bad games, release them anyways, um, listen to feedback, do it again, and do it better. You know, once you get in development, you'll start understanding the basic loop of press play in Unity, see your game, make some changes, do it again. But there's this whole scope beyond that of, um, you know, what does it mean to build a game so that it will actually become some, some kind of executable or thing that a person can download and just click on their phone or click on their computer and use it themselves. So there's extra skills around that. And they'll inform how you do your core development. And then once it out, it's out there, um, how do you market it and publish it and make it interesting and exciting so people will actually download it? There's a whole art to that as well. And it also informs how you do the core development. So going through that full loop um, whenever you have time is really important. Now, every game doesn't have to get released. Um, and there should be games that you do that are just purely for your learning. But building up a portfolio with lots of little 60 second or whatever videos of some of the stuff in there, because people aren't going to play all your games, but recruiters will go and look um, at a video or two for 60 seconds and, and say, Hey, they made this thing. And it doesn't matter. You know, some of you may not be trying to get into the games industry directly, but you're trying to get into adjacent industries, um, interactive media, or, um, you know, XR is used a lot for training and other applications. But um, first off games, people are, they've got their fingers in all of this stuff now. Uh, and second, a portfolio is just compelling, even if you're a programmer and you don't think that you need a, a portfolio. I'll tell you, every programmer that applies to us with a portfolio has that much better of a chance because um, they have something that looks different than everybody else's resume. Um, but it's, it's an obvious and required thing for anyone going into design um, or even the art side of games. But yeah, um, 
thank you. Go out there and build some games. Uh, I look forward to talking to anyone in the Q&A and in the chat. Um, but from this point, I can turn it back to Tyler. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much, Drew. Absolutely. Uh, and we, like like Drew said here, we uh, I will bring you back up on stage uh, in a little bit. I'll invite you back up for some Q&A in the end. Um, so if anybody has any specific questions for Drew, feel free to pop those into the, the Q&A or the, the questions tab there, I should say. And uh, we'll make sure that we, we kind of go back over to that at the end there. So great. Thank um, you. Yeah, of course, of course. And now um, I would like to invite our second uh, guest speaker up on stage today. Uh, the second speaker for today is a quality assurance engineer at Riot Games, Elizabeth Pring. Uh, Elizabeth is a multi, I'm going to try and make sure I don't mess up my words on this one. I also tried to practice this sentence before too, and let's see how I do. Elizabeth is a multidisciplinary technologist with experience working on globally released products in the gaming industry. Elizabeth is also a Women in Games ambassador and has connected with women in the STEM space to highlight their amazing efforts in education, quality products, and generational stereotypes. Oh, I did better than I thought I was going to there. So um, awesome. Uh, welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Let me share my screen. Perfect. And I'll hop off stage. I'll, I'll pop back on uh, after Elizabeth has finished here. So awesome. Hello. Is it working? I just see it loading. Can anyone see? Oh, there it is. Okay. Yes. Okay, cool. Sorry. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> I'm really happy to be here and speak with all of you. I really enjoy events like this. Um, it's very exciting. Video games are cool. So you can see by the title inside game testing i wanted to focus on where my experience comes from which is mainly in quality assurance but all of these topics in this presentation can touch really anything in the software and game development space um so let's get started hello thank you for joining me today and this wonderful event um my name is elizabeth purring aka riot wonder dove is my summoner name at riot um, and my career spans multiple industries, but focuses on the one thing, quality assurance. And I'm currently a quality engineer at Riot Games, and I work on team fight tactics, as you can see by this adorable chunk here. I had to get him in a slide. Um, and before that, I was actually a chemical process engineer in the cannabis industry. I am a medical patient, and I like really love working with chemistry and understanding complex plants and science. So that's something I really wanted to do. And um, first, I want to take this time to outline like the main objectives of my talk and give an overview of what quality assurance really means, um, especially in the realm of gaming, and then walk you through my career journey to showcase the adaptability and versatility of QA skills. And then last, I'll provide some tips for those interested in breaking into game development. Um, so let's get started here. First on my career shift. So this field spans so many industries. When you think of quality assurance, you think of, you know, different packaging and different products you buy, right? Like having bad quality with anything. Um, and I began as a chemical process engineer. So I was working on molecular cannabinoid extraction, which included, you know, working from seed to oil to consumer. So it's actually a very similar experience than um, to, or compared to my experience now in games. And I try to tell students this all the time, that even if your experience is coming from something very different than where you want to be, it doesn't matter because you can always apply those skills. Um, whatever you are doing can help you anywhere you want to go. So please keep that in mind and don't be down on yourself if you feel like you need to be one place and you're not where you think you need to be. Like, don't focus on that. Just focus on like your craft and learning, always learning something. Um, and I know it seems like my journey was a big leap. And I've been asked in every single interview I've ever had, like, why did you change careers from chemical engineering to gaming? And a lot of that 
came from, I wanted to do something new. I've been a gamer my entire life. I just like wanted to try something and it is risky and it is scary, but it is worth it. And I think everyone should be pursuing the things that they want to do. And I hope I can help you through this presentation to get there, at least get some insight on how I did that. Um, so here's a visual of my experience um, from Cannabis CQA. And just like Drew, I started Xbox as well um at microsoft which was a great learning opportunity and this is a macro picture of cannabis flower here um i worked on the xbox series x and s um and that was a great project to get started on i learned so much about games that i had no idea what it was before um and i failed a lot on this project but it really like taught me so much about what game development really is from a player standpoint to a developer standpoint um, and then that brought me to Nintendo and I've worked on Metroid Prime Remastered. I've worked on Mario Graph Super Rush and Splatoon 3. Um, these are very different games. The development was completely different and the testing was completely different. And woo, these were some very interesting projects and I'm so grateful to have had the opportunity to work on them. I really loved working on these games and I learned a lot at Nintendo. They have very different development um, processes than a lot of Western studios. So it was a really special time um, to learn how they do things. Um, and then from Nintendo, I worked at Bungie on Destiny 2. And that was awesome. Um, I'm a Warlock main. And I've done all the raids and dungeons. I have my own clan. I was a really big fan, big gamer. Um, so it was really fun to work on that game. And then that lands me an opportunity where I'm at now, working on Team Fight Tactics at Riot Games. And so I've had a few games under my belt now, but I still feel like I know nothing sometimes. And games will do that to you. So never feel like you don't know anything because I promise that you do. I promise. Um, okay, now let's go into like QA roles and kind of like what I do or, you know, what these kind of jobs entail. <clears throat> so... At Riot, I take on a pretty multifaceted role in quality assurance, and um, Team Fight Tactics is a strategy game. It's a very complex game, and it's gained global attention, and so now we're really trying to focus on improving our quality. Um, Team Fight Tactics was built very quickly. It wasn't built with really solid uh, foundational processes or workflows because it gains such traction early on, which is really exciting and great for the company, but very hard when you're in QA because you wanna make sure that things are in great quality. So we've really been focusing on that this year. Um, and my initiatives that I'm quality lead of include the esports space, the player progression space, social aspects, the around game experience, rewards, and the rank systems. Um, I think a lot of people assume, you know, when we do QA, it's always on the gameplay, but there's so much more to games than just gameplay that create the overall player experience. Um, and these initiatives each like present very unique challenges at Riot. For example, like ensuring the integrity of our rank systems is not just about functionality, but that user experience. And our round game experiences, like Drew mentioned with tutorials and player onboarding, need to be intuitive yet comprehensive. And something with complex games is having that tutorial, right? Like, how do you play this game? Like, what items should I build if you're playing TFT? Like, what augment should I pick? How should I move these champs on my board? Um, and that's something we're really focusing on is, is how we can better teach players to play our game and have an understanding of like what we're actually giving them. Um, it's a very interesting space to be in. Um, and yeah, just wanting to fit all the pieces together and making sure that we have a good gaming experience. <clears throat> now, this slide looks really corny. I know that. Um, but I wanted to go over it because more than testing, it's about creating experiences through quality. It really captures the essence of like what like QA is. And it's easy to think QA is just about testing or it's just about defects. But it's so much more than that. And what we're really doing is shaping the player experience from the ground up and ensuring that we not only have a bug free game, um, but a truly enjoyable one. And we're not just testers. I like to call us on our team like experience creators and then people boo me. But I promise it's true because we want to make sure that we're ensuring that every interaction and every feature and every moment in our games meet the standard of quality and that it translates to a memorable experience for all of our players. Um, so now let's talk about esports. 
Um, esports is really exciting. This is the first time that I have been in the esports space and the competitive space. And it's very, very exciting. I'm going to keep saying that because I'm just so hyped about it. Um, we are having our first global LAN tournament for TFT in December. It's the first time our team is going. And, you know, the games industry can really present you amazing opportunities like this for you to learn. And I'm very, like, excited. <laughs> uh, looking forward to going with our team for our first, like, global esports event because there's just so much that we've done to get to this point. And I want to talk about QA in particular with esports because it's not something that a lot of people talk about. Um, esports has revolutionized the gaming industry. I actually went to the Valorant World Championships here in LA for the very first time. It's my very first esports event. And it really just opened my eyes to write esports and just esports in general and how exciting that is. Um, I know Brian mentioned earlier an esports track for management. You know, that could be really exciting to go into too if you're interested. Um, there's so much space and growth in this field. Um, but there's definitely a layer of complexity that is added with esports um, to QA that extends like far beyond our day to day activities. And when we talk about esports and QA, we're not just ensuring that a game is functional, right? We want to make sure that there is a fair and competitive environment for millions of people to view and participate in. And it's not just about the game itself, but how it's played also on a competitive level. We actually have teams at Riot um, that are what we like to call the sweaty players. And they are just really good league players, CFT players, Valorant players. And they do, you know, quality analytics and insights and, you know, talk about meta and, you know, how how things are going in our game. So it's it's a really cool space to be. And so, you know, if people are like, oh, you're playing this too much, but you're really understanding the game and you're you're trying to understand how it works like that could be a space for you too so don't think you can't get into games and you can't really like be a good player because you can um and you can work on really cool teams um in this space as well and i always tell developers to get in the game even if you are building a game um like you mentioned like build games just do stuff but also play your game test your game please test your game build your game and just play other games. You'll learn about games so much by playing them. Um, so do that more. And yeah, get competitive. It's it's super fun. So next I wanna go into what all these adverse roles and responsibilities in QA are actually driving towards, which I've said before is a quality player experience. Um, and this is really the heart and soul of QA. And you can see by these photos here, this is from what's called our Riot Tech Blog. And if you're interested in learning on how we do anything there on kind of an inside look into our games and this uh, article in particular about patches and bugs, um, please check them out. They're really fascinating. My coworkers, Gavin and Alex, go over um, our process and it's really exciting. And I recommend this for any place you want to work or places that you're interested in learning about. like. Go and research, read about it, like figure out things that you like. Even if you are building a small game as well, um, look at things that you enjoy in other games and you can try to replicate that and build it on your own. That's a really great starting point. Um, and again, test your game, please. I feel like this is missed a lot when people are building games so they don't test it enough. And I know it can be really hard when you're first starting, but make sure to test your game or it'll really build a lot of skills in the QA space, not just as a quality assurance engineer, but also as a developer. Writing quality bug reports, for example, is super exciting. And whether you're working on progression systems or social features or esports, um, each of those roles are designed to contribute to that engaging player experience. So it's not about just finding bugs or gameplay. It's about making the game more enjoyable and memorable for the players you want uh, to play your game. Um, and understanding these goals is why I made this slide for quality player experience, because this is what should help you align your efforts. So you're not just solving those like technical problems, but you're also enhancing the player's interaction. Um, and so that's something I always think about when we do testing is like, how is the player going to respond to this? How can we make this experience better? Now for the million dollar questions about key skills. 
Um, when it comes to skills, we can start with the technical. <laughs> um, when I was at Bungie and I worked on Destiny 2, I had a lot of technical experience I brought over for chemical engineering. I was able to do white box testing, which allowed me to navigate through script files and enabled me to locate and diagnose uh, issues effectively. Um, also, thank you. Um, another skill that I'm going to talk about is the soft skills and communication, because this is something that's often overlooked in technical fields, um, but is actually a key to success and shift uh, projects. And I really want to talk about how everyone here can be better in their communication and also being an advocate for diversity in STEM um, in order to have better products, we need to have more diverse teams and more diverse industries. And it's really important to be uplifting um, voices of others and building a better inclusive community. That's the only way we're going to move forward. Um, so let's get into that. So I know some of this might look similar in multiple bullet points here. The reason this is here is because there is so much you can do in games. And I know when you look at this, it's like, holy crap, there's just too much. Like, where do I start? What do I do? And again, this isn't just for QA. I put this here because this is from my experience, but you could apply this to any role or any position that um, you want to pursue. Um, I want to talk about networking first, because networking is what will really allow you to make those connections within the industry. Uh, Brian mentioned this earlier, and I wanted to touch on it before I forgot. Um, I'm just ignoring my speaker notes right now because this is something that I really had to learn, and it's not a skill that's taught very well, and why UCI and CircuitStream provide you this platform to connect with industry uh, professionals like myself and Drew and others because it's really important to get out there, to show that passion, to show that you're working on something. And even if it is bad, even if it is like the most garbage game you've ever made in your entire life, like who cares? All that matters is that you are building something, that you are learning something and trying. Like one of our interviews at Riot is a problem solving uh, interview. And that is about what have you learned? What have you taken from this garbage game? Like, what have you learned from that? How did you improve on that, right? Um, they want to know like your thought process. They want to know how you dealt with these hard problems and how you're learning from it and how you're planning on improving and um, taking those skills and how you can make their games better or any company. Um, every industry interview I've had has had some type of problem solving questions. A lot of people focus heavily on technical stuff. And I understand that's like a big focus on what skills you need. But so much more of it is the values that you bring, the communication you bring, and the relationships that you are building. Um, so you might be wondering with QA, for example, do I need to be a programmer? Do I need to learn you know, programming? And you don't need to be an expert. But I like to tell people that you should probably have a basic understanding of like Python or C Sharp or C++ um, because this could help you with automating tests, with understanding code changes, with communicating more effectively with developers. Um, so something I did was, you know, I worked um, with programs like CircuitStream and UCI. I did stuff on Udemy. I did a lot of research. I bought some books. Like whatever it is that you need to do, um, do it. Just learn. Don't worry about what anyone else is doing. Just focus on what you need to do and what you need to learn because your path is your own and every single person's path to game development is different. I promise. Every single person you talk to in this industry has a completely different path and way to get into this industry, whether that be how they did their portfolio, how they did their interviews, how they built up their experience. Um, so that's why I wanted to also highlight on here the versatility um, and skill diversity. Because as I mentioned previously, it doesn't matter what you're doing now. If you want to get to games, you can do that. I know it is really hard, and I'm not going to sugarcoat that. It is very hard to get into games. Even with chemical engineering experience, it's taken me years to get to where I am now. But you can do it. You can transfer your skills into skills for games. And that alone is a skill that everyone here can work on. Is like, how can I take my current skills now and my schooling and these projects and games you're building into something actionable 
for a position that you want, whether that be an internship or a junior position or even a mid-level or career transition uh, kind of position. So just have faith in yourself, okay? <laughs> I just, I feel like a lot of students message me and they're like really down and like, I can't get these jobs or I'm struggling with my portfolio, how can I do better? And it's like, just keep trying, just keep doing it. You'll get there and you'll learn. Um, and attending events like this is super helpful. Anyway, I talked a lot about that slide, so I apologize. I'm talking so much. Okay, next, why soft skills matter. This picture is hilarious to me. Um, this was taken at our Riot League Studio Barbecue. This is me um, talking to one of my coworkers. She's a UI UX lead. And then the smaller picture in the corner is with my product lead and tech lead um, with our plus ones, my fiance in the back eating cake. I love this picture so much. He's just like, mm, cake. And I'm like talking about TFT or something. Um, but I wanted to post this about soft skills <laughs> because this is something I have personally had to work on in my career. Like every single job I've had, I've had to improve on this. I am a very forward person. I have a very technical background in the way I communicate can be very sharp, very blunt. And that's not always helpful when you're working with different kinds of personalities and games and creatives, right? Um, so I wanted to post this picture of me uh, when they sent it to me that they're like, oh, look, like you're talking to somebody, you're smiling. And I'm just like, wow, who is this person? Um, because I've really worked hard on building these relationships with people and getting to know them and building up um, an understanding of like what they do and how I could do better and how they could do better. Um, and so I just wanted to shout this out here because it's really important to build relationships and, and learn from others. And again, it's always a continuous learning process and I'm still getting better at my own communication. Um, and again, like the capacity to communicate clearly uh, can really be a decisive factor on whether or not a successful delivery of, of a project ships. Like it can all come down to communication. So um, again, another corny slide, I guess this is like my thing now. Um, communication is key. Um, and you see repeated on this slide because I really can't stress it enough. And a field as multifaceted as game development, where you're constantly talking with developers or project managers or even players, um, you need clear and effective communication because that can make or break projects, like I said. Um, and like if you're documenting a bug or a risk or you need a summary for a complex issue, that can be truly a difference between a successful release or a very, very costly mistake. And I've seen this happen before. Um, even just a difference in miscommunication can cause a lot of problems. Um, so never underestimate the power of good communication. Um, next, I want to talk about um, DE&I because I do not believe that inclusion and advocacy work is extra or nice to have. Um, it is a necessity. And a diverse team brings a wider way of, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> I'm too excited. A diverse team brings a lot of perspectives is what I was going to say um, by helping identify and solve problems that might otherwise be overlooked. Um, and in game development, really like any other field, diversity strengthens um, our community and it ensures that our work is not just efficient, um, but also equitable. And you can see in these pictures, this was this year for our league pause to play, which is something we do every year where we take the day off and we play League of Legends. And we, al we also have one coming up for TFT, the game I work on, and I'm really excited. Um, and you can see this is just some of my, my QA team, but I'm one of the few women on my team. And I have been uh, one of the few women um, even at Bungie and Nintendo. It's, it's pretty common, but we're really increasing the amount of women and femmes in game. And that is super exciting. Um, and so I love this picture because it shows just the amount of diversity that we're bringing and um, those voices. And then the bottom picture is uh, TFT had a socials uh, to get to know the developers and one of our favorite things about TFT. And so I submitted something and they shared it on socials. And Riot Games doesn't have credits. Um, and I unfortunately have not been credited for most of the games that I've worked on. It's just something that's really unfortunate in the games industry. However, I look at this and I think of it as my credit um, because it was posted by Team Fight Tactics. And I was like, oh my God, like 
that's me, right? And so having that visibility and, and that awareness and sharing the diversity of our team is like really, really exciting. So if you think you don't fit in here because society or the games industry or whatever has made you feel like you don't belong here, screw them, okay? Like straight up, like don't listen to them because you can do whatever you want. And we just need to break down those walls and break down those barriers so we can start building a more inclusive community. Um, so just be yourself authentically and you'll get to where you wanna be, I promise. Um, you don't need to be anybody else. Okay, let's go into entry packs. Um, so after all of that, if you're wondering, well, how do I get into this field? Um, internships are a great way. Uh, we just finished our internships at Riot. We actually have some opening up for engineering right now. So apply if you want, um, reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to chat with you about that process. Um, uh, internships are amazing. They're really the lifeblood of any job that I've worked at. Uh, I love interns. They're so excited. They bring so much perspective to the teams and they do such incredible work. So definitely apply. It doesn't matter where, again, doesn't matter. Just apply. If you get something awesome, work, gain that experience and then apply somewhere else if you know that's where you want to be. So just get that experience. Um, and one of the beautiful things about games development is how transferable these skills are within industries. I think I talk to a lot of people in games development and sometimes they feel stuck. They're like, well, I don't know if I could do anything else than games, which is funny for me coming from a different industry because I'm like, you could do so much, right? Um, so again, really think about the skills and what you're doing and how that can transfer. Um, because even the classes with uh, UCI and Circuit Stream with XR, I mean, that doesn't even translate to just games. You could go into medical. You could do so many different things with that kind of technology and learning. So don't think you're limited just because it's games or software. You could really do whatever you want. Um, just building that foundation is super important. Um, and companies like Riot and any other company I've worked with really value those diverse skill sets. So if you're coming from a different industry, don't see it as a setback. You should really be seeing these as assets. Um, and then I made this slide. Um, I know we're ending near the presentation. I'm speaking a little longer than I wanted, um, but I wanted to leave you with this thought <clears throat> that QA is not just a destination. Game development is not just a destination, that all of this is a journey of continuous learning. And I hope everyone got that from this presentation that there's just so much to learn and so much to do, and you are never gonna be capped by learning something because there's always something you could be doing and improving on. So whether you're starting off as an intern or you're shifting careers or you're an established professional, there's always something to learn. Um, like I'm learning stuff every single day. It's amazing. And yeah, there's always something fun to do. Now let's talk about the partnerships. I just want to shout out uh, you see on Circuit Stream, um, that made this event possible. It's really exciting. It brings us all together to learn from each other. Um, and something I also wanted to say was at Riot, our number one value is player experience first. And it's really refreshing to see that both UCI and Circuit Stream have a similar student first approach. Um, because when you have a field as dynamic as game development, AR, VR, or prioritizing the needs of players, those are all really important. So it's really amazing to be collaborating with people that share those same values as us. Um, they also provide invaluable courses uh, that focus on skill building, especially in like C-sharp programming. If you like Wild Rift, they work in Unity, um, which is really vital for anyone looking to step into AR VR applications as well in game development. Um, again, all experience is experience. Don't let it stop you. Um, and what's fantastic about their courses is they focus on real world applications. So you can apply and like really bring those to professional positions. Um, so if you want to get deeper into this field, I highly recommend checking them out. Um, they're really not just teaching, they're also preparing you for a successful career. Um, and thank you. So that's me. <laughs> There's Chong. Amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. thank you, thank you. Um, you're getting resounding feedback from the audience right now. I see lots. Oh, of I didn't even see the chat. I'm so oh. sorry. Wait, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, my computer both. covered it. 
both of you guys i feel like my slides are going to be so boring now we've got like drew showing the first games that he's made and how funny they are and just then <laughs> we've got the chunky characters and yours and mine are going to go back to uh to more more corporate looking slides but uh either way I'm, I, I promise i'm going to share some valuable information in the slides here so elizabeth no um, i will i'll invite you back up on stage probably in just about five minutes or so no i'm going to share some information about the courses um yeah we'll see you in just a couple minutes perfect and I'm going to close your presentation there. Let's see if I can do it. Yeah, perfect. So uh, like I said, I'm going to share a little bit of information uh, about the courses, about the start dates, just in case uh, anybody was uh, looking to register for the, the upcoming dates here. Um, so the X, uh, the 10 week XR development uh, with Unity beginner friendly course is project based. Uh, it's delivered online. Um, in fact, all, all of our courses are considered to be be beginner friendly project based and they're delivered online. Uh, this course in particular is designed for those interested in starting their journey into XR development. It has both synchronous and asynchronous weekly projects and assignments, and there are eight hours of classwork, five hours of office um, or five office hours per week as well. So once you complete this course, students would uh, finish with an XR our developer certification. Uh, you can see the, the certification there on uh, the badge uh, rather with the UCI on it as well. The 10 week interaction design and prototyping for XR course is formatted quite similarly to the development course. Uh, actually, I, sh I should pause there really quickly. Uh, David, uh, who works with us at CircuitStream, is just sharing the course links for each of these in the chat. Uh, so if anybody wants to uh, save the links or go in and take a look at the courses after the presentation today, uh, just feel free to, uh, to follow the links directly. Um, so the, uh, what was I saying here, the, the 10 week interaction design and prototyping for XR course is, uh, very similar to the development course. Uh, it's both synchronous and asynchronous weekly projects and assignments. And there's also eight hours of classwork and five office hours per week. Um, this course though, is meant for those interested in starting their journey into XR design versus development. Um, students would also complete this course with an XR designer certification. And again, you can kind of see the badge on the screen there for this one. And the finally, the 30 week game development bootcamp has 10 hours of class per week with five hours of live lectures, uh, technical and career labs and weekly office hours. Uh, the bootcamp is designed for those interested in learning unity game development, um, and it teaches students how to create immersive digital worlds, uh, bring imaginative game concepts to life. Uh, this course is beginner friendly, but it is best suited for those with a little bit of unity experience. So um, if you if you have some sort of coding experience or if you have unity specific experience, uh, it'll it'll certainly assist you moving into this boot camp. Um, if you don't have any experience at all and uh, you'd prefer to start off at a complete beginner level, uh, the the 10 week courses would certainly give you uh, the unity experience you would need to move into the the developer boot camp there. So uh, students would complete this course with a unity developer certification as well as a unity associate programmer certification. So you can see on this one, there is an additional badge there, uh, the Unity Certified uh, Associate. Basically, once you complete the course, uh, you would then take the uh, exam for that and be certified, but the course itself would uh, prepare you to take that exam. And uh, the cost for that exam is included in, in the course itself. So it's kind of how that, that part works. Um, now I'm going to go over a little bit of information on the uh, the pricing of the courses. Always important. Uh, I think I think I saw a question in there earlier asking um, about the the pricing. So this will this will probably help out. Uh, we have uh, the special attendee offer for everyone in today's session, uh, as I mentioned earlier, but you can see on the left hand side, the regular pricing. So the 10 week course, uh, the starter package is 3995. The uh, plus package would be 4995 and the boot camp is 14995. Um, but with the special attendee offer, we'd be able to take 15% off of all three of those. So I'm going to share the upcoming start dates for these courses as well. Um, but if you are looking to register for any of these, just make sure that you mention that you attended today's session. And you know, so we can make sure that we get you uh, the 15% off of the course there. Uh, we typically run uh, these courses every few months, but the upcoming cohort dates are shown on the screen here. Um, so it would be October 2nd for the XR Development with Unity course, um, October 3rd for the Game Development Bootcamp, and then October 16th for the Interaction Design and Prototyping for XR course. Uh, we likely have uh, cohort dates, uh, you know, with just a few months after these ones as well. And I believe with the promotion, if, if you weren't available to start on these dates specifically, we can probably apply that um, the attendee discount that we have for the attendees here today for the following cohort too. So um, basically, if you have any questions, the main thing is just reach out and book a meeting with the admissions team. Um, they can provide you know any sort of details that you need with that. Um, 
that's that's like probably got ahead of this slide here. That's kind of what I was going to say here. And, and uh, maybe David can share in the chat the, the link for uh, booking a meeting with the team here. So if you do have any questions, uh, just follow the link that David's going to share in the chat there in just a moment. Uh, but that's it. Without further ado, um, I'm going to get my more boring slides off the screen here and invite both of the guest speakers back up on stage here. And uh, we can do a little bit of Q&A. I think we've got uh, some good questions in the chat. Drew and uh, Elizabeth, you're welcome to pop back up there now if, uh, if you can get back up on stage there. There we go. Perfect. Awesome. So I'm um, just going to kind of go through the, the questions that we got in the, the questions tab and uh, I'll put it up here. Um, and then between the three of us, we can do our best to answer. I, I have a, a scary feeling both of you will probably be a little bit more qualified to answer some of these questions that I will be. So we'll see how this goes. Um, oh, the first question I can see here is the, the program free um, that obviously came through probably nearing the beginning. Uh, so as, as I just showed, there was uh, several programs and I kind of shared the, the pricing information for each of those. So uh, hopefully uh, I answered that question. But if you do have any more questions about the pricing info, just, just let us know there. Um, we had a question about financial aid and I can see that our team kind of responded that. Uh, Michelle, if, if you have any further questions about the financial aid there based on uh, Zoe's response, just, just let us know. You, uh, you can just reach out to us directly and we can do that. But um, I guess this, this one's for you, Elizabeth. <laughs> can, can we get a tour of the riot headquarters? <laughs> always, always love these questions. Um, probably a little bit more involved uh, to get a tour of the headquarters. Oh, sorry, Elizabeth, if you're I'll, Oh, no, I just realized I was muted. Um, I know Riot does tours. So maybe talk with your school um, and see if they could do a tour. Um, I already have my guest um, <laughs> booked uh, with my fiance, so he comes onto campus sometimes. But I can give personal tours occasionally. Um, but yeah, I don't think I can give everyone here a tour, unfortunately. Um, but we do have pictures and videos. And um, yeah. Try to talk to somebody and they can probably do a class tour or something. Yeah. And like you said, I'm sure there's a, a more formal way through Riot directly. They probably yeah, use some absolutely. sort of group tours at, at certain points. So I'm not the best the person to ask that one. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> but it is fun. And I do I, see them occasionally. Yeah. I always laugh at questions like that. I mean, you gotta, gotta shoot your shot and ask the question, I guess. Yeah. Right? But, <laughs> um, do you think making, I can't post this one on the screen because we already uh, answered this one behind the scenes, but I'll just read it out so that everybody can see. Uh, do you think making a couple of games and joining related boot camps uh, will help me even if I don't want to directly venture into the gaming industry? Uh, rather, I'd like to get into software programming. Uh, I can see you nodding already there, Drew, if you, if you wanted to weigh in on that one. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like, like I said, I got my first um, my first job in tech. It was an internship uh, at Microsoft, but that was driven largely by the games that I've worked on. Um, obviously, I'm a little bit biased, but I think that oftentimes games, especially from a programming standpoint, are more impressive looking than uh, tech applications you could build. So they can sometimes be a more, more powerful, powerful portfolio. Ooh, a lot of Ps. Um, <laughs> than, than just working on generic web apps or mobile apps. Um, and honestly, like being passionate about what you're working on is super, super helpful for making something um, better because it's going to be, you know, it's going to be about the amount of time you put into it. So I would recommend that almost over some of the alternatives. Absolutely. And I see uh, our staff here uh, noted or responded and basically said the, the development skills can be transferable. Um, and I know, Elizabeth, you did a, a whole portion of your presentation basically yeah. talking on that and how the, the skill sets are transferable. So absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. So Rita, hope, hopefully that between the, the, the four of us, um, Zoe, myself and, and the two speakers here that we were able to kind of get those that answered for you. Um, how is culture in the gaming industry? Oh, period. I thought that was going to keep going. How's the how is culture in the gaming industry? Is it like the tech industry or do they have different kind of culture in the industry? Hmm. I guess I'll talk about this one. I'm sure people have read about, you know, the riot stuff and whatnot. Um, actually, it was a big concern of mine when I first came to the industry, just gaming in general. It's, you know, a very bro space, right? That's what people always talk about it. Uh, Male dominated industries. Um, and it was really hard for me at first. And I think we're still building a better process and 
you know, that's why I talked about DE&I. And I think the culture is really improving. There are so many incredible people in games that are focusing on accessibility and DE&I and building more diverse teams. And so I think the culture isn't where I want it to be yet, but it is getting there and having events like this and staying connected and asking those kind of questions is what will help push that industry forward and, you know, build that uh, culture. So awesome. that's and I how think I think about it right now. Yeah. And I think, Drew, I think you, um, I'm assuming that's your initials in there. The Oh, yeah, it is. I can yeah. highlight over it. Um, I see you answered as well. Maybe I'll let you just kind of expand a little bit on, on your response there. Yeah, there's a character limit. I kept going and then it stopped me. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, again, like my experience in tech was very brief, but a lot, lots of friends there as well. I found like, I mean, if you look at the largest tech organizations, they are massive. And games for all the revenue that they generate and all of the you know fun and pleasure that they bring for all of us. Um, game studios are pretty small, actually. Super and small. there are corporate yeah. places you can work in the game industry, but like orders of magnitude smaller. Um, so you're gonna get a more corporate vibe from a lot of um at least the big tech companies, right? Um on the flip side, like games is a relatively chaotic space there's a lot of creative work to be done there um it's not as mature you know as the tech industry in some ways um and there's a lot more um you know folks that are sort of just behaving in in the way that you have to work in creative spaces which is that you got to try and try again and like the deadline you know may or may not move while you're trying to do that right and that's created some of the problems that the game industry has to deal with around crunch um, or at least it's contributed to it, right? Um, I found the the games industry to be more collaborative in my experience because people are used to coming up with ideas, throwing them out, getting feedback on them. Um, that was really nice to me. I think in a lot of under industries outside of games, um, people become very precious with um, their ideas and things like that because they don't have this opportunity to iterate on stuff all the time and get used to stuff being thrown out and, and getting feedback on it. But, but that's also just a you know the quality of the people you're working at with that, wherever they're at. So yeah, and my experience from my standpoint, I guess just you know um, connecting with students and connecting with industry partners and uh, watching people kind of you know thrust themselves into the industry after they take the courses. Um, from my experience, the, the the people, the networking is incredibly supportive. People are always willing to kind of uh, test each other's products or give advice to each other, uh, share lessons that they've learned. That's a big one, you know, because you kind of learn really important, valuable lessons as you go through and make 10 horrible games and submit them to the world and then get the feedback. <laughs> and, um, so yeah, it's uh, from my experience that I've seen, it's a, it's a very collaborative and, and supportive uh, industry, uh, both on XR and, and in gaming. So people are usually willing to, to share the lessons they've learned. So um let's see here is the is xr design more along the lines of world creation and 3d modeling uh, how does it di di differ from the development one so somebody in our team answered this question the xr design course is exploring the best practices to design and prototype um, initiative usable and uh, and sorry intuitive usable and human-centered experiences uh, for ar vr and mr well as the xr development course is about coding uh, the the end user experiences so um yeah, I mean, hope, hopefully that that kind of explains a little bit more. We've got test syllabi for both courses as well. If you want to take a, a close look through, you can kind of see. Uh, in fact, if you click the the links that we put in the chat earlier for the the course pages, it should take you to a syllabus uh, download option as well. So you can kind of see the the full breakdown of each of the courses. Uh, will the synchronous sessions be recorded uh, for these courses? Yes. Um, so all of the uh, the courses, uh, the actual classes for each of these courses are recorded similar to this live presentation today. Um, so even if you attend a class, uh, you can go back and kind of re-review uh, the lessons that you you saw previously, especially, especially if you're going and trying to practice and, and, you know, do some development on your own. Sometimes it's nice to kind of go back to your lesson, open up and, and use it as a guideline as you're going through and, uh, and kind of doing that. So uh, every, everything is recorded, though. Um, do you think I'm going to put this one up because no one's answered it. I can put it up. Do you think Unreal will also come uh, up with a plugin for the Apple Vision OS? Or do you think uh, the partnership between Unity and Apple alone is worth uh, learning Unity for XR despite the recent troubles uh, with the runtime free fee? I was waiting for a Unity question to come up um, in this presentation. I'm surprised this is the first one that's come up. I think uh, initially when the announcement came out, there was more questions, but I know they've kind of changed uh, the stance a little bit since then. And I think they've made it a, a little bit less aggressive. So um, 
But uh, do you think Unreal will also come up with a plugin for the Apple Vision OS? Um, I don't personally have any in insight on that. I don't know, Elizabeth or Drew, if, if you would have any sort of insight on that side. I don't have any insight on that particular thing. Like my my feel is that, you know, Epic and Unreal will continue to try to engage in the XR space, but Unity's got a pretty solidified position um, as the, like the go-to um, platform or engine for XR stuff. I know we've done, you know, we do work for hire, so we build sometimes entire games for other companies. And anytime we're in that space, um, we definitely do a lot of Unity development. Um, and there's a lot of tools, especially as you're getting into it um, on smaller projects. Um, I find that Unreal can be a little bit um, daunting for uh, for you know individuals or small teams to get into when you're trying to do something like like an XR game. Absolutely, yeah. And that's that's more insight that I'd be able to give on on that point there. But we do have an instructor team here as well. Um, that probably would be able to give it even more information on that specifically. So if you have more questions on that, uh, just reach out. I actually can't see who asked this because we copied it from the chat. Um, but Zoe, uh, Zoe and our team likely uh, caught name of who that was asking that. So just let us know if you have any more questions with that. And in terms of the uh, the Unity announcement, something um, that we wanted to share, at least from the circuit stream side as well, uh, we've already you know leaned into this message several times in the presentation without even uh, mentioning the Unity uh, update. But the skill sets we we teach and the tools we use, everything's transferable. So we're partnered with Unity. We use Unity. Um, you know, as Drew mentioned, Unity is is a, an easy tool to use in a lot of senses. It's you know, a little bit more approachable than some of the other ones can be. Um, so that's why we've we've always kind of stuck with Unity. But the skill sets, um, or if somebody had a, a you know personal preference to use a tool outside of Unity, you can certainly transfer the skill sets there. So, and I also think the uh, Unity is probably gonna they've they've already backtracked some of their announcements. So I don't think it's quite as scary like I said as it initially was there. So. Um, let's see, does the course include portfolio reviews, uh, mock interviews, and job placement? So the the 10 week courses are um, not career track courses per se, they're most mostly kind of beginner friendly courses to get you into the industry for XR development and design. Uh, whereas the uh, 30 week uh, development course is a career track course. Um, so that one comes with um, uh, not job placement per se, but we, we do several things. Um, we have like a pitch day at the end of the course, uh, where we invite industry partners, uh, similar to the, the two folks who are here in the, in the room with us today. Um, in fact, I'll probably be connecting with them and seeing if their teams want to uh, join the upcoming pitch day that we have for our graduates. But um, we basically do a live presentation where the students can present the work that they have um, completed during the course. Um, and you know, hiring partners would have the opportunity to view the work and then reach out with contracts or with offers. Uh, I know at the, the previous pitch day, we had a couple contracts go out right during the actual presentation itself. So, um, but it, you know, it, it all kind of depends on um, what companies are looking for that at the time. Uh, outside of that, we certainly go through the portfolio with you. We help you build your portfolio in the course. Um, we'd have people on the team who would be willing to go through mock interviews with you and just make sure that you're, you're you know, comfortable and confident going into your um, basically putting yourself out there for any interviews or doing any sort of presentations. Uh, with the pitch day, it's also a way for us to kind of get you to step a little outside of your comfort zone, uh, present your your work in front of a group of people and kind of get used to doing that because that's going to be something that would be, um, you know, a standard as, as you move in as a developer, uh, as a, a designer. So, um, so hopefully that answers. Um, it's a little bit more on the career track course than it is on the 10 weeks. But outside of that, we have uh, an amazing network of people, current students, past students, uh, industry, you know, individuals, um, all available to network. And once you complete the courses, you're still in our Slack, net, Slack network. Network. Ooh, you can tell it's the end of the presentation. I can't get my words out. Um, but the Slack network is for everybody. So uh, once you've completed, we don't kick you out. In fact, we encourage you to uh, support and work with the other students that are going through there. So. Um, can we do some networking with you all? Absolutely. Um, you can find me anytime. Um, you can look for me on LinkedIn. You can reach out to me through link uh, through Circuit Stream directly. Um, for both of the speakers here today, I'm sure they wouldn't mind if you hunted them down on LinkedIn um, and uh, and followed them there. Um, if you like uh, Drew and Elizabeth, feel free to share your LinkedIn profiles in the chat there for everybody. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Networking is uh, the name of the game. So. 
Um, can you talk more about the uh, plus version of the 10 week programs? Uh, yeah, the, the plus version just comes with additional support. It comes with additional sessions, uh, private sessions uh, with instructors. Um, I, I can, um, or we can probably expand a little bit better on that, Maggie, in a, in a conversation. If, if you want to reach out to the team here, we can certainly kind of share what the differences, all the differences between the two courses would be and, uh, and show you what, you know, the plus package includes. Uh, awesome. My thumbs up there. Perfect. I'm just going to put that one up. So we've done the answer. Uh, do you think Unreal will also do a plugin? Uh, I think we already did this one. So I'm just going to mark this one as done. Um, coming from the fashion industry, uh, currently photo retouching um, image and art direction. In your opinion, do you see AR, VR reshaping this industry? Um, absolutely. I mean, I can kind of see AR, VR moving into uh, many different industries. Um, for, for this one, let me take a look here. For fashion industry, uh, photo retouching, art direction. Um, I mean, we're already seeing a ton of um, applications through XR being created for fashion. People are able to kind of, you know, um, visualize what different outfits would look like or create different sorts of things in that sense. So I can kind of immediately seeing it there. But um, do you, either of you have any other suggestions or any sort of information you would uh, uh, add into that one? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think anything you want. So here's the thing is I come from the mindset that you can do really anything with technology. And that's what's really fascinating about it is I don't think it will limit you on anything that you're currently doing. If anything, you'll have limitations. Technology provides limitations, right? And so understanding what those are and what you can do and can do in the space is what's going to be important. Um, but I don't necessarily reshaping the industry. I see it more as complementing the industry or adding on to the industry. I don't think it's going to change what's been done for hundreds of years um, with fashion and how that's changing. But it will add a new, you know, dynamic to it for sure. And we we see this with like streamers, right? Um, and we have so many streamers working with like unreal and all those different types of plugins and they have like real-time physics simulations and it's really exciting it's an exciting time to be in there and you know showing all their outfits and designs it's it's very cool to see so yeah i mean there, there's been so much movement especially in like yeah. young startups that are sort of like games and fashion combined right but even i mean league of legends and esports partnerships with with um, yeah. fashion brands and things like that or you know skins yes. and there's so many different ways that they're starting to intersect and orbit each other it's, it's pretty it's actually a really interesting space right now i think i'm on um the same page as, as elizabeth where i think like they're probably going to complement each other it's probably not going to change the core of what fashion is, but there's a lot of interesting stuff happening on the fringes of it. Absolutely. Thank you both. Answered that better than I would have. Um, this one's for you specifically, Elizabeth. Are the Ryan uh, engineering internships available to those wanting to change careers? So I'm not on an internship uh, team, um, but what I do know is I think you need to be enrolled in some type of course uh, or university or something similar. So I can't give a concrete answer to this, but I do think it is student related. However, um, there are so many positions out there, even if it's like not at right with our current internships, I'm sure we do offer some kind of like more entry level roles, contracts, um, uh, and just reach out to me and I will figure out that answer more concrete. Um, and honestly, there's no harm in applying. Just apply. I think one of my biggest uh, tips that I give people is to apply. And that's how I learned to get into this industry, too. Um, and going back to the other question about mock interviews, I don't think you should be looking at courses to t teach you development skills, to be looking at interview skills. They're two completely different worlds, in my opinion. Um, and I think some of the best advice I can give is to just always apply, even if you don't think you meet all the requirements. There's actually so much data to show that women and femmes in particular only apply when they feel they meet 100% of the requirements and men meet like 70% and they'll apply. So apply when you meet like 70% of the requirements, okay? Um, and fail, fail so much. I have interviewed with Google, GitHub, Facebook, uh, Facebook Reality Labs, Apple, like I've interviewed at so many different companies, even if I like didn't really know anything or understood what was going on. I wanted to get to know the team. I wanted to get to their interview process. And that is the fastest way of knowing what they're looking for, 
what they're testing you for and what you are missing on your resume, like literally just apply interview and you will learn so much about yourself and how you can improve and what these companies are actually looking for. So I hope that answers your question, especially if you're transferring careers like I did. Um, I tried going the internship route, but I think it's better to just go, try to go for a position if you can and just really translate those skills into a, a full-time role. Um, plus one to everything about just applying. Um, yeah. <laughs> some of the bigger companies are more rigid about what constitutes an internship. So oftentimes smaller and medium-sized companies would welcome um, folks applying to internships that are looking for a career change. And so you should definitely consider that um, if it's not like explicitly stated somewhere like, you must, uh, you know, have been enrolled in, in a university program or something like that. Um, consider it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I just mirrored the same feedback based on my conversations with, you know, indie studios, larger studios. Um, Bun Bungie is a great example, just because you mentioned uh, that you were at Bungie previously. I know that they uh, just launched an early in careers portion of their their company. Yep, um, that's what so I was in. Oh, mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. So yeah. I, we're, yeah. We're, we're connected with their team, too. They were actually just at our previous pitch day. Um, for the graduates. So um, yeah, so there's lots of opportunities. There's tons of indie game studios too that would be hiring people for, um, you know, looking for less qualifications to kind of get in the door for an internship or something along those lines. So larger studios just usually have a few more gates to get through is all, but that's 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 normal. So um, perfect. Advice for um, a path uh, to the role of a narrative designer? I wouldn't be able to answer this one directly. Does anybody have any sort of advice on somebody looking to get into a narrative de designer role? Um, I could take a crack at it. <laughs> I'm obviously not a narrative designer or designer, but what I can tell you is that a lot of the folks I know who are in those roles, um, they, especially as they got started, they did not limit themselves to games. They wrote for whatever you know, whatever they could find and um, tried to do games whenever they could. Um, there's a more limited need for narrative design in, just in terms of the volume of positions across the industry. And so a lot of people that do narrative design also write books or write for television or write for this or that. Um, and I think those people do consider um, that to be an important part of your portfolio as well. Obviously there's differences. Like interactive media is not the same as, as traditional linear media. Um, but I think a lot of those roles that there are fewer open positions, uh, audio has a similar, um, kind of thing where a lot of folks that score for games also score for TV and movies. So. Yeah, that's great advice. That's, that's much better than I was thinking. That's, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Again, um, just diversifying the skill set, right? Like we're reiterating that here where there's a lot of roles in games. Like I actually work with somebody who's a designer on TFT and he also writes rules for 40 K um, right on the side. So that's super common in this industry is you'll find people that do all kinds of little things. Um, and actually one of my friends is a narrative designer. And uh, like Drew said, she um, it's actually moving to Netflix soon. Um, so we'll miss her here at Riot, but it's very common to move from film to games. Um, and I have another coworker that does comics on the side. So, you know, there's so many different things, whatever, is your interest just do it right like just explore it try something out build that experience it doesn't just have to be games that will help totally. thank you both that was yeah that was great um and i i wanted to mention too i'm going to put up the next question uh we did drop a few more polls into the polls tab during the presentation there so uh feel free to interact with those i just wanted to make sure that uh that i mentioned those i, I forgot we dropped those in a little bit before there so um what programmer platform on vr do you recommend well, uh, this is tough um, just because there's so many different ones. It kind of depends on, you know, how much you're looking to spend on it, uh, kind of what you're looking to do with it. Um, Oculus is the, 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 the platform that we're using mostly for our um, VR and our courses because it seems to be the most uh, common. It seems to be accessible for most people and it's, um, you know, most things work with it. Uh, but having said that, there's there's a whole variety of different um, types of VR headset that you can kind of play with, um, and all of them would would work with the skill sets that you're learning in the course. So you're not limited to um, to one. You don't have to go for one. But if you're looking for just kind of like the generic, um, easy to use, easy to get, not overly expensive, the Oculus is, is probably the one that I would I would push most people towards, or at least that's what what we use in the course there. 
Okay. Let's see here. Um, would you recommend game development bootcamp for those looking to change careers to gameplay engineer, graphics engineer, or combat uh, design engineer? But a hundred percent. Yeah, that's that's the bootcamp's kind of made for for exactly that. So um, all of those positions would be something that you would be able to achieve after kind of moving into that path and, and moving through the the bootcamp and learning those skill sets for sure. I would do want to call out. Right. Yeah, I would agree. Again, any foundational understanding is going to be super helpful for branching into these graphics in particular is very math heavy. Um, so I just want to call that out right now. I think that's something a lot of people, uh, students that I mentor that want to go into graphics, you're like, I really want to work on graphics, but they don't realize the math intensity that comes into it. Um, and again, math is really exciting, really cool. I don't want anyone here to think it's like super scary or anything. It allows you to do really amazing complex things. And that's why we have such cool games and such cool graphics now. Uh, but keep that in mind that this development is building uh, that understanding and foundation with these boot camps, but graphics in particular, you will need to take on more learning and you know, maybe they'll have another boot camp graphics focus. Um, but just wanted to call that out. Don't expect to be a graphics engineer after a boot camp is all I'm saying. <laughs> but it was definitely a great start. Yeah, and I actually with with all of those, even with that, you know, like a game play engineer, graphics engineer, combat or design engineer. Um, these are all pretty complex uh, roles in the industry that you would be able to to work towards. Um, you know, for somebody taking a 10 week um introductory course or even the 30 week course you're going to learn a lot of the foundational skill sets but like elizabeth said too like it, it takes years sometimes to like you know consistently put yourself out and learn and and build things and apply to different jobs and then you know after a few years you look back and you're like wow like look at my resume look at what i've accomplished but you certainly can't do that um coming right out the gate you, you do need a bit of time to kind of build that up for yourself so but it would be the same with any industry like if you take an inter introductory yeah. course going into any any new uh career change you're, you're going to need a little bit of time there before you're you know the professional in that space that you eventually will become those are great goals though like absolutely mm -hmm. yeah oh yeah and then uh oh here's here's the question i thought this was going to come earlier what are your thoughts on the unity license changes <laughs> so i kind of touched on this already before um i know that they've they've changed their positioning a little bit and made it a little bit less threatening already than it was initially um but the main thing is is we we still like unity like we're, we're partnered with unity we use unity because they're it's a great tool for teaching people the skill sets but the skill sets can be used in other development tools um you know, in the d design course um, that we have available just through Circuit Stream directly, we also have a design bootcamp. Um, and that one is leaning a little bit more into Unreal skills as well. So, you know, just to give you an example of different types of platforms that we work, we have a whole bunch of different tools that we use in the development course, the design course, uh, but Unity and, and Unreal would be some of the tools that we use and we're certainly not limited to it. So um, we still like Unity. We we love, you know, how, how user-friendly uh, it is. Um, we were a little shocked with the initial announcement. We're kind of happy that they retracted it just a little bit, I guess, from, from what it initially was, but um, we're just kind of watching and, and seeing the landscape. But we know that our skill sets are transferable. So, uh, do we have lifetime access to the lessons if we want to refer to them after graduating? Absolutely, everything's recorded. Um, you are still in the Slack network, um, sorry, the uh, Discord network, um, and you still have access to all of your recordings. So you can go back and refer to your recordings even you know, a couple of years afterwards if you're working on a project and you wanna go back and see what you learned in one of your lessons, uh, you still would have access to do that. And let's see here, how, how would you recommend hosting and sharing a portfolio of games? Um, this is great. I'm going to let both of you guys answer this one. I can already see, Drew, that you answered this one, but how would you recommend hosting and sharing a portfolio of games? Uh, do you put links in them on the resume or do you put links to a website with the videos of them? Um, thanks in advance. So basically, how do you summarize your work and, and display it and show, showcase it to people there? I'll let you go first, Drew, just because you, uh, you actually answered that one. <laughs> sure. Um, anywhere you can get a 60 second video of the content is great. Um, you should put a hyperlink in your resume for sure to wherever your portfolio is at. Um, from there, I think like the type of portfolio you're trying to show off matters. If it's a game design portfolio, um, you should go to a place where you can watch videos and probably download the game. If it's an engineering portfolio, maybe you have the opportunity to also flex your engineering skills a little bit and host your own website that you put together and showed off. Like that's, that's what I tried to do. Um, I want to call out itch.io as a fantastic, easy place to upload games, 
um, screenshots, videos, and a description of the game, which is pretty much everything you need. And then they have like a page for you as a creator where there can be lots of games. And they encourage you to put up like game jam games and all sorts of like whatever low fidelity 48 hour, you know, experience you've created is super good for that. So um, a lot of the students that we found had really great um, portfolios. They were just hosting all their games on itch. Anything they made, they would put it on itch with a description, a video, and some screenshots. Um, and you could download it and play it if you wanted to. Or maybe you could play it right there in the web editor if it's um, a simple enough game. That's also huge bonus points for that. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, maybe it's just a YouTube channel. Like it doesn't matter too much. Um, I think Itchio is a great, a great and easy one though. And what you said uh, earlier, Drew, just kind of adding to your point is, um, you know, uh, recruiters might not always have the time to be able to play your full game or to do something like that. So yeah, just just putting it anywhere that they can digest the content and they can see quick videos of, of what you've created is, is definitely going to be able to display your, your skill sets there. So describing it in a few bullets in your resume is necessary, but never sufficient. <laughs> Please yeah. link out the content. Oh, totally. Um, and I'm just having a look through here. I think that is it for the questions tab. And I'm pretty sure our staff did a good job of grabbing all of the questions from the uh, chat tab and copying and pasting them over. So I think I think we've answered. Um, if we did miss anybody's questions, uh, I wholeheartedly apologize. Please just reach out to us and let us know. We're, we're happy to kind of answer them after the event here as well. Um, but yeah, they, they shared, Elizabeth and Drew both shared their LinkedIn profiles in the chat. So if anybody has any questions or wants to connect with them, uh, please feel free to. Uh, mine is just, uh, if you search Tyler Trap at uh, CircuitStream, you'll find my, my LinkedIn profile there as well. You, you're certainly welcome to add me. Um, but otherwise, uh, thank you to both of you so much for joining this event here with us today. Um, the information you shared has been uh, invaluable. I know the, the audience is loving it. We're getting um, tons of pos positive feedback right now. Even uh, I can see people typing in there. So thank you so much for joining the event. Um, we look forward to uh, to inviting you to to join some, some future events. And I'm probably going to send you guys some invites for the upcoming pitch day as well. But um, thank you for taking the time. Um, and the audience is saying as well, thank you for answering all of our questions here for us. So. Perfect. All right. Well, I can uh, I can answer uh, and end the event here. Um, look online uh, for the the future events that we will have through Circuit Stream uh, or through UCI. We will post all of those, and uh, we will look forward to seeing everybody here again in the future. If you have any questions about the uh, the courses or the pricing or the promotion that we have, uh, just reach out and uh, ask the admissions team here. But um, on that note, uh, thank you, everybody. Have a fantastic day. Cheers. <laughs>